We're very excited to be able to have the president of the California Dental Association here today. We invite uh, the president every year, and so this year Dr. Del Brunner is here, and he's going to talk to us about uh, dental public health across the state in California. Thank you. Well, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it's been great to hear from Brittany and Pat, and I'll look forward to hearing from Bethy. We had a really nice dinner last night and talked about uh, all kinds of issues, and uh, I wanted to thank uh, Dean Reddy uh, for inviting us. Uh, it was great, Mike, to, to be there last night, and uh, please uh, thank Dr. Chaffee as well. Uh, we, uh, we look forward to many uh, wonderful years working together with uh, UCSF and, and Dean Reddy. We had a great relationship with Dr. Featherstone, and I think moving into the future will be a very solid one also with uh, Dr. Reddy. Um, I have been a, a, a wet finger dentist, wet gloved as it is. Uh, started out as a wet finger dentist. And, um, but uh, I, I am a, a, a shameless proponent for dentistry. Uh, I love my profession. I love the opportunity to get and uh, to help both the profession, the public, and uh, particularly the students. Uh, I really look forward to the opportunity to, to speak with the students today from five to six. I've done that in the past at different schools across the state. Uh, next week I get to talk to the uh, OKU kids at uh, Western, so I'm excited about that opportunity as well. Um, but today I just want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the state of California. Uh, it's, it's not a, a national issue, but in many ways we are a microcosm. Uh, we have all kinds of situations and uh, demographics uh, from A to Z in California. And uh, among those, um, you know, we've been working uh, very intently since 2011 to reduce barriers to care, access to care. Um, in certain areas of our state, you have a very hard time finding a dentist, which seems kind of odd, but the access to care is a problem. We've been working very, very hard on that. We've collaborated with local components, with state governments, with local governments, and done our very best to develop those things. And it takes all of us working together in order to meet those needs. One of the very exciting things that's happened over the last two or three years is uh, we were able to uh, help in hiring Dr. Jay Kumar, who is our state dental director. And uh, Jay came from the state of New York and uh, has been an amazing, amazing asset. Uh, we work very closely with him. Uh, CDA headquarters, for those of you that don't know, is in Sacramento. We're about a block and a half from the state capitol. So we have a, a very, very strong working relationship with uh, the state government and the legislators there. We have a couple of legislators that are dentists, uh, which certainly helps our cause, uh, Dr. Jim Wood in Healdsburg, and one of the state senators that I forget right now. But um, We've been doing a, a very good job of uh, developing a state dental plan. Uh, we have used CDA CARES, which I'll talk about in a minute, to facilitate some of the research that Dr. Kumar has used to begin to develop some of that. But one of the, the great successes that we've had over the last two or three years was Prop 56. And uh, I know some of you have been involved in Prop 56, which is the tobacco tax uh, that was uh, in November of 16, implemented in 17. And um, it was a, uh, a, a single tax on cigarettes, tobacco products, that that money was supposed to be completely swept into health care to offset the cost that tobacco and tobacco products cause as a drain on our health system. That was great. Uh, that was our third attempt. The first two attempts were not successful. And finally, the third attempt was, which I guess speaks to the fact that uh, anytime you try to affect change, it, you have to play the long game. And uh, CDA and our legislative uh, government affairs people uh, understand that. And uh, just as we're going to talk in the middle about a little bit about sugar-sweetened beverages, again, we'll be playing the long game on that one as well. Uh, last night at dinner we spoke, and, and I said that, y you know, we talk about taking sugar out of our diets, and we kind of go, well, good luck. Well, 50, 60 years ago, if you would have said, you know, you can't smoke within 25 feet of anybody that's breathing air, you'd have gone, yeah, right, that's not going to happen. Well, it has happened. And, and if you look, like I said, in a long perspective, we can affect change and we can uh, do behavior modification, which is a great thing, and increase the public health as a byproduct of all of that. Uh, out of the tobacco tax, I don't know if any of you uh, realize the hard numbers or not, but, but on an annual basis, 
it generates a billion dollars towards health care in this state. A billion with a B. That's divided between medical and dental, okay? Uh, dentistry, with the federal matching funds annually, we get about $300 million to help offset costs for public health and dental specifically, which has, has raised reimbursement rates. It's restored adult Dental coverage in the state of California, which we did not have. We had children's, but we did not have adult coverage. And I remember years back, when I was in active practice, we would treat, you know, dental patients, but it was more of a ministry than it was, you know, a, a building part of your practice. You did it as a sense of uh, social obligation, medical obligation, take care of your patients. So, so now we've been able to raise. Across the board, 40% on the reimbursement fees and 80% in some specific things related to restorative and, and preventive prophylaxis scalings, etc. So we've had an enormous effect, uh, $300 million a year uh, that, that is renewable. The, the other thing that happened is $30 million specifically went to Dr. Kumar to develop public health in the state of California. That's separate from the $300 million which is a great uh, uh, boost for Dr. Kumar to develop uh, oral health awareness and public health here in the state of California. In addition to that, the state underfunded the program last year and, and they established $30 million to go towards debt retirement in the state of California. For students, there's two parts of it. One for students that want to pursue public health, okay, and the other, so $30 million went into this pool. It's an annual number, okay? And, and if you uh, were to agree to go serve in an underserved area for five years, it's worth $300,000. It's $60,000 a year. So many of our students nowadays are graduating with large amounts of debt and say, well, I, you know, I have a heart for this. I'd love to go serve in the public health arena, but I can't if I want to do this or support a family or, or do the things that I want to do after I get out of school. Well, now there's a vehicle where we can begin to develop that, which is great. We're very, very grateful. We have a hope that that will be continuing into the future, and, uh, but we'll see. Uh, the, the state uh, allegedly has underfunded again, so we'll, we'll see how that goes for next year. Uh, the other work that we're doing is with sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, we have had uh, three separate cities in California that put a tax on sugar sweetened beverages. We were looking to start a state, statewide sugar sweetened beverage tax. And out of nowhere, uh, there was a, a sort of midnight behind the curtain deal that took place. And uh, legislators, uh, the big sugar beverage industry, and a non-healthcare entity collaborated to, to put a moratorium on any local sugar sweetened beverage taxes for 12 years. And we kind of, yeah, you kind of go, what? How can you even do that? So CDA, uh, very quickly, very quickly, like the next day, uh, initiated um, uh, a process whereby in 2020 there will be a ballot initiative to remove that and restore that ability to go back to the local local arenas. Uh, we understand directly the relationship. We have, I've been interested to see the stats from Brittany and Pat, you know, on on rural versus urban decay, uh, et cetera. And, and sugar sweetened beverages is a huge part of that. I volunteer in a free clinic in Indio, California, where I live, and I see patients come in all the time, they're drinking horchata and Fanta and Coke and all of these things, Agua Fresca, and, and you just go, no, 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 you can't do that. That's, that's not good stuff. And um, so I get to experience that on a very, very regular basis. So we are in the process of that. Again, uh, we understand it's a long, uh, a long series, but we are uh, actively pursuing all of these things at a very, very uh, significant state level. So, uh, and we're, we're confident it will lead to eventual success. So, uh, so hang in there and stay tuned. I also want to take a moment to highlight the CDA Foundation, CDA CARES events. Uh, we have had 14 of them over the years. Uh, Gene Creasy's here in the room with me. Gene and I have been involved in uh, a, a whole number of those. And, uh, 
it's a, a wonderful way to uh, provide immediate care in terms of relieving pain, infection, swelling, uh, reestablishing people's smiles, whether it be Laurel dentures uh, or uh, creating an anterior removable prosthetic device that restores their smiles and self-esteem. Uh, just remarkable stories that we get to experience. And it's been a wonderful way to, to both help the public, but sometimes even more importantly, we were just talking a minute ago with Steve, that, that the legislators come through and they see what's going on, and they see the people lined up for blocks, and they see the critical need, and that, I think, is a large part of why we have been able to reestablish a lot of the dental funding for state, for state dental care. And um, so as a, as a kind of a sidebar, I wouldn't say unintended sequelae, because it is intended to help educate them and let them know about that. So, we know we can't replace uh, a solid, well-functioning system at CDA Cares, but it does serve to fill those two voids, which is very, very significant at the state level. So this is just a quick look um, at what's going on at CDA. I'm very, very proud to uh, be able to uh, represent uh, the profession. I'm honored. Uh, it's great to be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brunner. It's a great time for California and Donald Public Health. Um, next, we have Dr. George Taylor to introduce our Global Oral Health Fellows. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for being here today. It's, it's my special honor to introduce three of my mentees um, who are um, just outstanding and excellent uh, students as well as compassionate, and it was their compassion and their, and their passion for addressing an unmet need in, in the California area um, with respect to Cambodian children and their oral health status. And it was, the, it was that passion in the, and the light in their eyes that actually um, compelled me to be able to, to want to work with them, and it's been an honor doing so. So I'm, I'm going to introduce um, Richard Kong. I'm going to introduce, I'd like to also welcome uh, Vicki Chu to come forward and also Sarah Pye to come forward to tell us a little bit about the research project that they started. Um, Dr. Bruno mentioned the long game. Well, they, were, they represent the front end of the long game. And also with the theme of our, of our session today, um, theory to, and education to action and practice, they're closer to the, they're, they're about ready to um, move into the action and practice dimension, um, having um, established themselves in the theory and the education. Come, please come forward and tell us about your project. They will, and I will say, um, then, um, upon completion, um, Dr. John, um, Dr. Barron's, um, Richard will introduce our speaker. Um, one last amazing thing I can't, I can't resist saying is that what a joy to actually have the originator of the instrument that you, that you used in your project. That's pretty amazing. That would be Dr. Turton. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Richard, um, one of the presenters here, who, and along with my partners here, uh, Sarah Pai and Vicki. Uh, so we're presenting on oral health-related quality of life in uh, Cambodian children and adolescents. Um, we are honored to present this research, and uh, you know, as mentioned before, Dr. Turton was one of the um, founders of our research who helped. We use her instrument to help us. Um, okay, so a little bit of background about uh, you know Cambodia and the Cambodian children. Uh, so. Um, just a little background. Uh, Cambodians are known to have a high burden of dental caries, um, with most recent report um, relating to children. Um, a lot of this research that we've gotten has actually the work through the work of Dr. Turton. Um, dental caries experience in Cambodia appears to be the among, us, um, among the most severe in the world. Um, the average DMFT for uh, children ages six is nine, and a comparable DMFT is in the Philippines, which is 8.4. It's a relatively high uh, DMFT. Um, DMT meaning uh, decayed missing field teeth. Uh, these characteristics are attributed to the limit to access to care and the knowledge to um, and, and knowledge to oral hygiene and health. Um, 
a little bit about our aims that we uh, um, that we attribute to our, that was attributed to our research. Um, you know, one of the aims that we, we that we were trying to um, to do was to establish a baseline in oral health related quality of life um, from ages eight to four, and children ages eight to fourteen in the nearby San Francisco area. Uh, we want to uh, evaluate the oral hygiene instructions and hope to produce a significant change um, in the related oral health related quality of life as well. And finally, um, we also want to include uh, participants uh, who have limited proficiency in English um, uh, by having a written uh, Cambodian translated uh, questionnaire as well. Uh, I'm sorry. And then so, uh, as, as noted right here, uh, there, there's one of the uh, questionnaires that we received from Dr. Turton. Um, and we use that as well. Okay. Okay, so here are some examples that we have from the CPQ questionnaire. In the past three months, how often have you had sores in your mouth, bad breath, avoided smiling or laughing when around other children? So from each of these questions, the children responded in the Likert scale shown. And while we were doing the, administrating the questionnaire, Richard was facilitating the symposium in Oakland during our first OHI session. So here are some pictures of our partner organization, Oakland Cambodian Buddhist Temple, Cambodian Community Development, Inc. Here are some more pictures of our partner organizations located in Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose. So we held our first OHI session and the, and the Cambodian Health Symposium at the Oakland Recreation Center, as shown. And prior to this event, we would go weekly to interact with the, um, the temple members. So this slide shows our second OHI session at the San Jose Temple. We use a sugar chart to teach them, the, teach the participants the amount of sugars that were in each soft drinks. And we, out of all the all, both OHI sessions, we only gathered 24 participants. So the CPQ that we used, um, the domains were separated into four categories: oral, um, oral symptom, functional limitation, emotional well-being, and social well-being. One finding that we noted was that the mean social well-being CPQ subscore decreased as the age increased, so meaning the younger children more frequently answered every day or almost every day to the CPQ questions that were administered. Um, one finding that we found was this one, but the rest of our data did not show any noteworthy patterns, and we thought this was due to our limited sample size because, unfortunately, our aim was originally to gather 100 children, but we only ended up with 24 after all of our um, OHI interventions, so we refrained from further analysis in hopes of obtaining more pa uh, participants in the future. So our greatest challenges um, with this project was gaining the trust of the local Cambodian population. Um, and we wanted to emphasize the importance of oral health to this population, which has traditionally viewed um, oral care as very low priority. Yeah, we wanted to gather enough participants, which was a little difficult. So instead of the f a large symposium, our future OHI sessions were two smaller sessions. And our most valuable contribution from this project is advice to share for conducting future studies and how to better approach the population. Um, our lessons learned included uh, understanding the community that we work with. Cambodian population um, is very averse to influences outside of the community. So building a relationship with them before initiating any intervention is very important. The head monk of Cambodian temples is very influential. And with the help of the temple, it's easier to schedule project events in accordance to the Buddhist traditional calendar. So for example, ceremonies are often held on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, planning must be done at least three months in advance, and all details should be intricately explained to partner organizations, along with multiple reminders. So some other things we learned uh, while gathering the participants were that um, the Cambodian community is largely due by a word of mouth for their communication. So even the flyers that we made, it was in the Khmer language. Uh, they were often ignored. So most of the children who also came to the temple were too young to participate in our age group, which was 8 to 14, and most of them were under 8 or even 5 and under. So in the future, we would consider increasing the pool from which to recruit from. We also learned that during the OHI sessions, it's really important to have volunteers that also speak the Cambodia language. Out of the three of us, only Richard speaks Khmer, and most of the parents wanted us to explain the study verbally versus having them read the consent forms. 
And we were also unable to follow up during the six and 12 months post uh, questionnaire because either the participants didn't want to come back or the temple was closed close due to renovations. So it's also important to work closely with the temple to include our study as part of their calendar um, to emphasize the importance of our study. So we would like to thank um, the global, Dr. Shafi and the Global Oral Health Partnership for giving us the opportunity and the support we needed for our study. And we really want to thank our amazing mentor, Dr. Taylor, um, for all his time and guidance. And without him, we wouldn't be here today. So next we want to, oh, sorry, questions? Are you discouraged? I'm sorry? Um, are you discouraged? Oh, okay. Uh, no, not discouraged at all. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm promoting dissent. Um, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, my parents are refugees from Cambodia as well. And I understand very well how the community is. Um, to me, it's, you really you have, a heart, have to have the heart for this, whether struggles you go through, whatever. Um, things you're trying to help, you know, sometimes you, you, you have to look past that and continue on and continue to do good. And that's the way I, I've been able to see that. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Thurton, Dr. Thurton here. Um, I had the pleasure of um, meeting her a couple years ago. Uh, she's a very special woman to us, and with our research, you know, inspired us to continue um, to do more research here. You know, in comparison to what she's done in Cambodia locally. Um, I actually had the, uh, the pleasure to meet her through Dr. Sakal Gutierrez, and um, you know, and Dr. Shafi as well. And um, you know, it, like like I mentioned, it inspired us to you know do things and and have a, more of a passion to. Uh, help out the Cambodian community out here as well. Uh, as mentioned, uh, children in Cambodia suffer from you know, severe burdens in dental caries over the last 10 years, and she has developed um, various approaches in you know, the managing of caries in Cambodia. Uh, those projects now include all the local policies um, and are relating to dental public health, and areas of active research are focused on uh, child um, health and nutrition. Uh, with warm pleasure, I would like to welcome to UCSF, Dr. Turton. All right, um, thank you for such a kind introduction, and I just think that that project that was just presented is really what we're hoping for when it comes to giving students an opportunity to interact with global oral health because the point of it isn't necessarily the numbers or what happens but what I could see that was being presented was a real humility around uh, a critical observation of themselves with reaction or an interaction with that community and so I think I think that's really cool I can't see where you are but yeah I really enjoyed that. <laughs> um, so I guess it's, this is a bit of a spoof, how to make Cambodia smile. I don't think that's necessarily something I could do on my own. But what I wanted to do was try and compare some of the different things that we've tried over the last 10 years and examine some type of framework as a starting point for how to discuss what we can do better. So let's set the context, and um, Richard mentioned some of this. Uh, this is a nice little map of Southeast Asia, and we can see most of the surrounding countries at six years of age are sitting on a DMFT of around four or five. We've got good old Singapore there on a DMFT of two, and Cambodia are the champions of the world with a DMFT of nine. And it's all very well and good thinking about numbers of teeth but it's even more helpful to think about what are all of the drivers of caries in Cambodia, what's causing it, what does that caries experience when we look outside of just a simple cavity, what are all the different things that we have, what are all of the tools in our arsenal that we can use to try and fight it, what are our resources and what type of operators are we going to use. So we know that in a Cambodian context we've got high levels of social inequality, we know that we have poor levels of food security, a lot of the farming and food production is monocropping. We've had a population that's transitioned out of a traditional diet towards, a, I guess we could say, Western diet. And um, I might be so bold as to say there is poor governance in that country. 
to hone in a little bit more about that Kerry's experience, it's not just that there are nine holes. Five out of six of those children have an active abscess at six years of age. And 20% of those abscesses are active. That means swelling or pus draining out of the side of it. Um, that means that on any given day, a teacher facing a classroom of 50 six-year-old children will have 25 of them who are experiencing symptoms on that day. So to put that into some pictures for clinicians, these images are of children who are kind of in that late uh, mixed dentition. And um, they're, so they're about eight or nine years of age, and it's really common to see this pulpally involved per first permanent molar. So that's about half of eight-year-olds have one or more pulpally involved first permanent molars. Yep, it's it's not pretty. And this these three cases represent about probably a fifth of the of the cases that I deal with in the schools that we're working with. So what I'm trying to do is kind of examine a progression from a camp-based dentistry through to prevention-focused and then an even more holistic approach, which I'm calling, for argument's sake, a systems approach um, that we can examine. So what I'm trying to hope to communicate in this presentation is that there's never really one approach that's going to fix it all. And there are lots of ideas that we can think about in terms of an ideal intervention but none of the interventions that we do are going to meet all of them. So let's examine that idea of the ideal intervention. So I've got a list of things here, and some of them are quite able to be precisely measured, and some of them are quite subjective. So I'm going to explore those things from that point of view. In terms of cost effectiveness, I'm really going to be talking about how much does it cost per person, how much does it cost per tooth to treat, and how much does it cost to prevent one lesion in a child. When it comes to accessibility, I'm talking about does it reach our target group and is it easy for them to um, get that care that they need? Scalability is really quite a subjective term, so for today I'm going to consider scalability in terms of cost effectiveness, but also in terms of the viability that that approach could actually be instituted by local actors. Um, in terms of positive behaviours, I'm going to just think about diet and oral hygiene. Um, sorry. And the obvious thing is reduction of disease burden, uh, which we can count quite nicely, and quality of life, specifically quality of life being measured using psychometric testing. And I accidentally pressed it a bit early, but I think that although I haven't had a lot of chance to use that wide body of work that looks at that social justice framework, all of those things that I've listed can be considered through that lens. So, um, make sure I say the right thing. So when I'm talking about uh, the social justice lens, what I'm talking about, the ways in which the intervention advances the right to health care for those who are most vulnerable. I mean the ways in which it orientates those systems and the ways in which it benefits people or children with the least amount of influence and the ways in which it could realistically be continued in a Cambodian environment and by Cambodian institutions. So my really um, humble way of trying to say that is whether or not those um, things influence social structures. So the most, uh, a lot of the times when we're considering the gross amount of disease burden that you've just seen on those slides, our instinct is to want to relieve that suffering. And a lot of time, our desire to relieve that suffering manifests as a bunch of us jumping on an aeroplane and um, doing our best possible effort, oops, sorry, and, and using our best possible efforts to try and relieve as much pain as we possibly can. Um, so we're probably looking at about, you know, a bunch of people and maybe around, let's say, five or six hundred children being treated in a session and maybe we might treat a couple of teeth per child. But how much does that really cost? Now I've seen a lot of people come to visit me in my second home of Cambodia and the cost of such an intervention ranges from 20000 to 100000 for a week to two weeks. 
And um, at best, you've got, like I said, 500 kids, maybe 1,000 treatments. So we're looking at about $40 per patient, about $20 per tooth. And um, in the best case scenario, you'll also be applying topical fluorides and sealants. We've got a nice study recently published out of Australia, which looked at people going up into the Northern Territories, and they got a nice 20% um, preventive increment, which if it was applied in Cambodia, and if it was implied in that cost structure, would cost uh, $200 just to prevent one cavitated lesion. So I've got this handy dandy little table here that's going to help tie that string across all of those different interventions. Um, we can see how that cost shapes up. It's accessible for that week, so I've put one little plus there. Um, but the issue is that it's really not scalable. And in terms of preventive increments, 20% um, really isn't enough for me. Uh, and we can see that it's disproportionately expensive. When we're thinking about that social justice lens, the real risk is that in going and placing ourselves in those communities, we could possibly be reinforcing the role of that community as passive recipients. And that really places those communities in a system where other people are making decisions for them. And so that's a real risk. So as I mentioned, with all of these visitors coming and going, and myself included as being a visitor, um, we really felt that tension and we wanted to move towards a purely prevention-based project. So in other words, we said, all right, no active treatment. All we're going to do is prevention and we're going to see how this shakes out. So the example of that um, model is a SEAL Cambodia model. So um, before I continue with some of the model aspects, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues on this. Um, Professor Callum Durwood was the principal investigator, and we had um, Dr Katie Batch and Dr Phil Sussex, who did a lot of work around setting up the protocol and training the team in this. All right, so the SEAL Cambodia uh, project really assumed that most of the new cavitated lesions happening among young children were happening in first permanent molars. And it assumed that across those first couple of years of school age um, living that we might change the oral hygiene to a point where they no longer needed the sealant or they were having better behaviours and, and the disease would reduce. So we went about and we set that lofty goal of 60,000 children over three years. We also recruited a research cohort to validate the benefit that we were or were not achieving. And here are our one-year results for our original protocol. So the first thing that I want to point out is that I've created new headings for the turtiles of disease experience. We start with high, we go to very high, and then we go to extreme. And part of the reason that I chose these titles is that once, once we broke that disease experience down into thirds, those in the least severe third were actually more severe than a lot of children that were included in sealant studies in other parts of the world. So I didn't think that those very high and extreme groups were very good comparisons in terms of the preventive benefit that we might see. So as it turns out, we didn't really prevent very many cavitated lesions. Um, and interestingly, it's actually consistent with the Cochrane Review on uh, GIC Fisher sealants, which says that we might expect to achieve between 0 and 30%, and we achieve both 0 and 30%. <laughs> um, and still, as you can see, that I may or may not have an extreme personality, I thought that this wasn't quite satisfactory for me. Um, and along with the rest of the team, we went around and we tried to think out about different ways in which we needed to change that protocol to make sure that we might actually realise a preventive benefit. Um, and after some time, we recruited a new research cohort with the new protocol, and these are the results that we got after two years. So again, we see that same gradient whereby the more extreme uh, children had a lower caries preventive benefit, and um, the children in the high caries group got a 50% benefit, which, you know, when considered the global literature, that's actually pretty good. Um, the other thing that we did along with measuring holes is that we used the psychometric testing um, around oral symptoms and we got a satisfactory 30% reduction in oral symptoms. 
the other thing that we saw happening was, um, and I think this is a classic case of a standard eight-year-old child in the Seal Cambodia program, we can see that one of the first permanent molars was probably cavitated at the time that we met the child. So that child still went on to have symptoms um, and is now quite an unrestorable tooth. And on the other side, we can see that the sealant's nicely in place. Yes, there's staining, but there's no cavitation. So the sealant's been successful, but for those who have got the best angle of the slide, you may be able to see the ICDAS4 lesion on the front of the tooth. So um, we have interproximal lesions. And once we um, remodeled our analysis, we could actually see that one in five of those eight-year-old children had interproximal lesions extending to the occlusal surface. And once we removed that from the analysis, we actually got about 90% prevention. And that's in our most recently um, published paper. So let's use our framework again. Um, the actual cost of the intervention over that 60,000 children was $2.50 per child, and on average they got about 3.1 sealants. Um, the cost then for preventing a new lesion was $7.50, which is a bargain. Um, we could say that it's accessible because we were going into schools. It was scalable to the amount of money that we had. <laughs> so um, this, the, all the money came from outside, and 60,000 is a pretty impressive type of scale, but really when the money stops, there's no more scalability. Um, the limitations we can then say is that although we did prevent some caries, we didn't address the suffering that was present at the time that we met the children. And it also benefits those less extreme children more than the children who need it most. And we're only really looking at one age group. So we wanted to take the learnings from that and the ability of our team to work together and move towards more of a systems approach. So what I mean by systems approach is that we acknowledge that there's some things in our environment that we can influence and some things that we won't. We're not just looking to say we want to find a platform to perform procedures. What we're trying to say is that we're trying to achieve caries management and hopefully, if we're really cunning, we're going to achieve caries management in a, in a community setting. So the first example of our attempt to go for a systems approach is the Healthy Kids Cambodia model. <clears throat> So the concept of Healthy Kids Cambodia is that caries happens in an, in an environment which has social and physical actors. So before we try and do stuff to people, we try and enhance their social environment by connecting them with referral networks um, and um, helping people be more aware of what's going on. For the physical environment, we try to change the amount of junk food in schools and we try to set up areas where it's easy to conduct a daily hand washing and tooth brushing. After that, there's the stuff that we do to people. So um, that's separated into three levels of care. We use a validated triage system so that those children who have the most extreme needs get a concentrated um, opportunity to receive care. Uh, level one is mostly focused on hand washing, tooth brushing, and silver diming fluoride. And for about 40% of children, we'll then start layering them with GICs. So that means atraumatic restorations and GIC fissure sealants, using our learnings from the previous project. And finally, about 20% of children will need comprehensive dentistry. That includes extractions and composite restorations. And we try to conduct that in the most controlled environment possible. So the best case scenario for us is that we can actually bring them into the dental school and treat them with the best suction and with the best tutorage. So here's some nice pictures of the team at work. Um, this one up the top here, our team are in the school using um, silver diamine fluoride. Um, good old oral hygiene instruction. The one in the top left, what we're actually doing is we're going back and looking at the ART restorations that we placed the year before to assess them. And um, we're also able to access the preschool population. And with those non-invasive techniques, they're actually more than capable of participating in our intervention, however they like to sit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of what our organizational structure looks like. We've got um, a whole 
bunch of people working in our act in our environment. Um, we have UP Dental, that's the um, University of Putisatra Dental School. We have an NGO which is One to One Cambodia, and we have another NGO that's just come on board, which is Catholic Relief Services. So among all of our partners, we're serving about twenty thousand children per year. Um, and we're doing basically as much as we can given the resources, but the assumption is that level one is the basis upon which we start to relieve that tension of suffering. So to um, hone in a little bit more for those of us who are interested in teeth, um, this is what we might see in a level one child. So at the time that this image was taken, the only thing that that child needed to make them comfortable was another dose of silver diamine fluoride. They had sealants the year before, and um, the previous treatment had been successful at managing those lesions that were there. This level two child um, has been managed just with silver diamine fluoride and GIC, so we can see some nice little ART restorations on those lower first permanent molars. The upper ones have um, sealants on them, and we can see that there's been successful arrest on those primary canines. This situation for a level three child, like I said, is about 20% of our caseload, and it's clear that we can't really manage that in one go, and we can't really manage that all that well in a purely mobile environment. So that child will get comprehensive care. We're constantly in the process of reviewing the success of this intervention. So here's just a summary of some of the studies that we've done to date. We've been able to manage about 70 to 80 percent arrest rate among that community. Um, we can prevent about 90 percent of new abscesses from forming. Um, our ART restorations are not as successful as we'd like them to be, so we're working on um, changing that. Our triage system, we're very satisfied that the criteria that we use actually is successfully identifying those children who are at most at risk and who need the most support. Um, and when we look on our database, we can see that when we have uh, schools inside our program for more than one year, the treatment need is halved. So that's looking pretty good. How much does this all cost? So this cost structure is based on either doing it in Phnom Penh or doing it in a province at the scale of more than 2,000 children. So after we take into account the material cost um, and all of the things that are needed all the way up to comprehensive care, we're looking at about $8 per child per year. So let's filter that through our system. If it's $8 per child per year and we're preventing about one new cavitated lesion for every two children. It's about $16 per lesion prevented at the lowest estimate, but it's a pretty good bargain when it comes to the cost per tooth for treatment. We believe it's accessible, and we believe that we're demonstrating that it's possible at scale. The test, of course, will be whether or not we can convince the government systems to replicate what we're doing. We haven't been able to measure a lot of behaviour change yet, and that's purely because we've been so busy measuring everything else. Um, and the same thing with the quality of life. I have a data set that I need to analyse sitting in my computer. When we consider that social justice lens, what we're trying to say is that there is really in this situation an integrated and collaborative way of reorientating those services in Cambodia towards that, those that really need it the most. And we're using local providers to um, deliver the care in a way that's driven by the needs of the community rather than the needs of us to deliver it at a certain time in a certain way. I'd say that the major limitation of this project is in fact that the child arrives at school with nine cavities already and so actually this project is far too late. So in recent times we've been um, gaining a better understanding of the natural history of uh, early childhood caries in Cambodia. This uh, photo or video is of our team in Ratnakiri province going out to collect data um, on mothers and their children. Um, actually today, as we speak, they are on their way back from Ratnakiri to Phnom Penh after collecting data on 1,316 mother-child diets. So that's their third data point. Um, you can see all of our partners there. It's a 
project that's led by UNICEF, but uh, Burroughs Foundation were very generous um, to give us the money to have the dental add-on. So that study is the Cambodia Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Study, of which I've just scratched the surface of um, what we're going to be able to understand. And um, here's what we can find out from that study about the level of disease among those preschool children. So when we look just as an overarching aim, uh, broad stroke, those children that are between birth and three years of age, over half of them have one or more curious lesion. And when we break that down by age, we can see that at the age of three years, about um, five out of six children have caries, and one out of six children already have an abscess. That's pretty extreme. When we're looking at their um, oral health behaviours, actually a good chunk of them are already brushing their teeth, but it's less likely that they're using fluoride toothpaste. Um, the major issue, and I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone in this room, is the junk food issue. So we can see um, Ratnakiri, Krache and Phnom Penh um, as variations of being uh, urban and built up towards rural. So Phnom Penh is the most urban and Ratnakiri is the most rural. And we can see that in Ratnakiri they have best access to packaged snacks and Phnom Penh have best access to sweet drinks, where those young children who are less than three years of age are consuming on average three sugary drinks every day. Well, on the day before our interview at least. So that's pretty extreme. Um, this image is from one of our oral health education um, cartoon stories. And um, you can see that Mr. Rabbit is calculating how much sugar has been taken in by this child who's, who's actually consuming what is a pretty normal um, diet for a young child in Cambodia. So with all of this in mind, this is the kind of picture that I paint in terms of the perceptions of, of those families around oral health. Actually, about 80% of them do state that primary teeth are important. But most of the problem is that they're not quite sure how to prevent the dental caries. Most of them know about toothpaste and that it's good, but they're just not really 100% sure about when to execute on actually giving the toothpaste to their children. Um, and most of them know that sugar causes dental caries, but they're in this problem where they just want their children to eat something. So that's where we're at in terms of um, what's happening with those families. And with all of that in mind, uh, our next approach at a systems-based model for addressing uh, caries is the Cambodia Smile intervention. Um, and this is my favourite slide for obvious reasons. <laughs> So the assumptions with this project in terms of behaviour change is that that special time when a mother's pregnant or newly given birth is a special time when mothers are most likely to be able to take on new information and implement new behaviours. Um, and the other assumption is that if we're able to deliver that information to them in small but regular bite-sized pieces, then we've got a better chance of um, getting that information to be meaningful. So the most, the most kind of straightforward description of this intervention is that primary healthcare providers, I mean nurses and midwives and so on, they, at the time when they're giving the vaccinations, will paint the teeth if they're present with fluoride varnish and give oral health education. Uh, this is an image of Dr. Soparit, who is our key trainer for the Cambodia Smile intervention. He's delivering training in... Uh, Kampong Spoo province where we're now um, accessing about 18 health centres uh, and this is our favourite training aid um, which actually we purchased from Thailand and those um, teeth are awesome. <coughs> so let's see what benefit we can gain. So what actually happened when we evaluated this intervention over two years is the children actually got about six opportunities to participate in the intervention but unsurprisingly, some children only received oral health, well, some families only received oral health education, while other families received both oral health education and fluoride varnish. So we could see quite a distinct pattern there where, whereby those families who were only receiving the oral health education still realised a huge preventive benefit, but that benefit was mostly in the shape of white spot lesions. If we wanted to stop those white 
spot lesions developing into cavitations, then we really needed to have that fluoride varnish as well. So we couldn't just do one thing, we needed both of them to start reducing the disease. The other thing that we did um, was to use an oral health related quality of life measure and the one that we chose was the family impact scale and what that does is try to quantify the impact of that child's disease on the family around them and um, I'm not a parent yet uh, but I'm sure that many of you can tell me what it's like when your child can't sleep, when they have pain, when they're unable to process what's going on, when you have to actually withdraw yourself from an activity because something's happening for your child. And so that's what this um, psychometric test measures. That brown line is um, representing one in two families in the control group who had an impact across that psychometric scale. For the children in the intervention group, it was only one in six. So we're not just benefiting teeth. Right, how much does it cost? So this is kind of the estimate of cost structure that we have, bearing in mind that we only, the pilot study was just four health centres. We're now upscaled to 34 health centres, so we'll be able to validate that cost structure a little bit more. But the number I'm going with is $5 per child per year. Um, so if it's $5 per child per year, and I'm not counting the white spot lesions so that it's more consistent with the other um, slides, but if we say that it costs about $10 to prevent one cavitated lesion for, um, for a child. I think that it's accessible because they're able to realise that access at the time when they're getting the vaccinations. Um, it's scalable because we're able to use actors and I hope that this cost structure will be something that's affordable within the present systems. Um, we do see probably the most remarkable reduction in disease burden. And when we're considering that social justice lens, we can say again, we're working within those public health care systems. We're able to work to reorientate those services. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to be in a position where actual shared resources are being reallocated towards this type of benefit. So now we get to see all of them side by side and really critically review what parts are going to work <clears throat> better for each different part of the population. I think probably one of the most remarkable figures there is that $200 special, um, although that's probably pretty cheap for getting a class 2 cavitation restored in a US context, we can see that it's 20 times more expensive than, for example, the Cambodia Smile intervention. So we can say that integrating the interventions into existing structures such as schools or maternal child services makes it both more accessible and more affordable. Um, we can say that if we want to get the maximum benefit for prevention, then younger is better. Um, and what we really want to say is that using those systems which are integrated within the wider public health schemes means that we're able to really um, deliver those services to the communities that are most vulnerable, hopefully. So let's go with a bit of a program status update. Um, these are the two projects that I think should be carried forward and we're sitting on a scale of about 10,000 children for the Cambodia Smile and 20,000 for Healthy Kids. Um, Healthy Kids realises about 14 operational partners where Cambodia Smile was sitting at four. And for both of them, our next steps are to advocate for policy change um, within their respective systems. And this really wouldn't be complete if I didn't acknowledge the honour that I've had in being able to speak in a forum such as this on behalf of such a huge um, group of people who have been making, able to make this possible. Um, so, yeah, thank you for taking the time to listen and I really welcome any questions. I think my question perhaps best fits into the systems approach and that is, um, is either community water fluoridation or use of fluoride tablets feasible in this context? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, 
So it's my opinion that the tablets are not feasible, but when it comes to water fluoridation, we have three cities in Cambodia which have reticulated water systems and that it could be possible. We're in about we're about two and a half years into a campaign to put um, fluoride in the water, and um, we had a little bit of an interesting journey because um, what happened two years ago was we got some funding from Singapore to do a feasibility study, and we um, conducted a proper literature review and um, all that kind of background stuff to say you know here's a report to the Cambodian government for why we think water fluoridation might be viable in Cambodia, and um, we had it nicely translated and a very nicely stamped letter that said, "May we please have." A feasibility study with the water plants to see if it's possible. But the problem was that the translation, this is my opinion, the problem was that the translation um, didn't capture the concept of feasibility. And maybe Richard can confirm for me, but as far as I understand, there's no word for feasibility in Cambodia. So what that meant was the Ministry of Industries who control the water plant and are very sensitive about their status over the last 20 years of, as having drinkable water at the tap um, received this as an extra burden on them and as a demand to, um, they must put fl um, fluoride in the water but they don't have enough information to do so. They then got their under their kind of office person to do a Google search on fluoride and um, they came back with a whole lot of reasons. Sweden doesn't have fluoride. These other countries don't have fluoride. All of the best countries are taking fluoride out. Why do you want to put fluoride in? Um, but there is light at the end of the tunnel at the moment because my colleague, um, Dr. Chanto, he treats the children or the grandchildren of the Prime Minister. <laughs> so um, we've just started another lap and we've gone back up through again with the um, Cambodia Dental Association and um, we are about to submit another letter. So hopefully that will lead to some benefit and a nice anecdote. <laughs> I'm over here. Oh, um, forgive me if I missed it. Did you state um, whether you used resin or glass ionomer oh, sealants? Definitely glass ionomer sealants. And um, we used Fuji 7. And we did actually, in that crisis of faith in the middle, test whether or not Fuji 7 or Fuji 9 was going to be better. And Fuji 9 performed be uh, sorry, Fuji 7 performed better. We went on with Fuji 7. Fuji 7 performed uh, better than Fuji 9? Correct. And triage for you Americans in this room. <laughs> Hi, thank you for a comprehensive presentation of all the work that's been going on and the fantastic work that you've been doing. Um, I have a, a question about your the, the last project that you part of the project that you presented, yeah. um, where you've moved to uh, working with women around the time of giving birth. Um, have you talked to any health economists about being able to use um, disability adjusted life years or um, weights of that kind to try to put some value on the impact of reaching to the mixed dentition stage without caries that then transfer into right. the permanent dentition? Um, the short answer is kind of. And the longer answer is that we have done some preliminary work around the CHU9D. Um, which leads to a quantified measure of qualies, um, and that's a data set that's sitting in my computer that I haven't been able to unpack. Um, and we also haven't had that full longitudinal data set um, to be able to see how those differences act. And um, we have validated that instrument for um, the six to 14 year olds, um, but we haven't validated the instrument for the preschool children. So. Um, I'd love to do a project like that if someone was prepared to fund it. <laughs> so we have a question. We both go to Cambodia and mine is very general. Mine is um, where 80% of the people live in the rural areas in Cambodia and of that 80%, probably 65% don't even have water. It's like, you know, uh, infectious disease is rife. They clean water. They bathe in this dirty water. Um, you know, we, we try and help with water wells, as do s hundreds of others. Uh, it's 
I think the studies are fantastic that you have done, but I'm saying I'm thinking that it only affects, you know, mostly uh, people that have access to clean water to start with. I mean, we're talking of children who weigh 20 pounds, 10 kilos at three and a half years of age. There's so much malnutrition. That's why also they have such bad food. But anyway, I, my colleague is going to talk about a dental question or, or comment. Thank you so much. The studies were fantastic. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for a great presentation. My name is Dr. Liliana, and we've been in Cambodia 11 times so far. We, um, but uh, I just want to mm, share this excitement, and um, we we did um, adopt a little school in Sienoquil, and we've been going there for three years, and we have 8,220 8, uh, children. So first year when we were there and second year, I was doing mostly uh, extractions and my dental team is mostly um, uh, Cambodian and we do have some uh, students from your university, which is great. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year when we were there, I noticed a big uh, improvement. Uh, I would say 50% of the kids did not have a decay, but I was also doing mostly extractions or not doing so much preventative. So that's like, a, a, and we did, yeah, we did a lot of health education um, with mostly grandparents who are taking care of the kids. And uh, improvement was improvement was great, and I actually saw, saw little kids without cavities. So that was such a shock for me because I never seen that before. So uh, keep up a great work, and this is like a great excitement for us to share with you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just make a little comment that um, part of the reason we're going through health centres is because they are in fact in those places where there's no water. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have one last question, Dr. Pollack. Yeah, how much of a game changer is uh, 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 SPF? Uh, yeah. Oh, I, well, I can tell you that the first day I arrived in Cambodia in 2009, I had silver diamine fluoride. So I have no idea about if it's a game changer or not because it's a normal part of my practice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you, Dr. Turton. And don't go too far because now we're going to have our panel presentation and Dr. Karen Sokal Gutierrez is going to serve as our moderator. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here uh, to have a chance to moderate this wonderful panel. We've had a great afternoon of exciting presentations and uh, I'm here as an envoy from one of your partner professions, the medical profession, who I hope we always remember uh, we're working towards the same goal. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your comments and questions because I think that our speakers really presented some very provocative information this afternoon. And I'd like to start actually by using my moderator prerogative <laughs> to, to start with the first comment and question. Uh, while, while you all are thinking about your comments and questions. Uh, one thing that I notice in terms of a commonality across your presentations is that all of you are working to train dental professionals in innov innovative ways to address the pressing oral health needs, especially for the most vulnerable uh, within your populations. Of course, here in California, and throughout the United States, we're also experiencing tremendous oral health disparities and suffering in our most vulnerable populations. And I believe that we here in California and in the United States can benefit greatly from applying some of the successful, the successful approaches that you all have used in low and middle income countries. So I would like each of you to give us one recommendation that you have for us here in California and the US to improve our training of dental and allied healthcare workforce here to enable us to deploy our health professional resources to reach our entire population, especially our most vulnerable population, for primary prevention of oral disease and referral for dental treatment as needed. It's a big question, and I'm asking just for 
one key recommendation from each of you. I, don't, I can't pick one. There so I mean, our partners have done such remarkable work. I would say my favorite examples come from those who have who really have a global perspective at the challenges and recognize the global forces at play, the food industry being a good example, um, social determinants of health being another example, that fall beyond clinical care and behavior change alone. Um, so I think looking at systems that include policies and education programs and skills development um, for, for a, a workforce that is able to um, move the needle on, you know, beyond those um, to not just improve access to care, but really to look at that tiered approach the, for prevention first would be my recommendation. Great. Thank you. Dr. Pat? Yeah, for my experiences working with the dental student and all more than 35 years, I think that teaching the dental students how to understand, you know, those disparity understand the poor, those disadvantaged group, their lifestyle, their social determinants. In terms of, um, from my experience, it's a special project. It's not in the curriculum, extra curriculum, because it will tell you that this group of people really want to do it. So for me, I always supervise, uh, you know, starting small groups each year for them, provide them opportunity, select the best, you know, groups, for them to have their own experience. So this is the thing that I think that for my experience is quite success. And I see them after they graduate, they can continue their empathy, their understanding, and carry on you know, the things that they would like to you know, bring quality to everyone. Great, thank you. Dr. Bethy? I think my suggestion is similar to Pat's. And I think the way that I would phrase it is just get them out of the clinic. So if we're going to really acknowledge caries as a social disease, then we need to understand the social conditions of those that we're serving, and we can't really do that in the clinic. So if we could get our health professionals to accompany those communities in real life, then we'd be able to maybe start to understand a little bit more about that social context of disease. Great, thank you. Okay, audience. Comments, questions, <laughs> raise your hand. And I'm Steve Silverstein, UCSF Dental Public Health. I have to say the most impressive part was that in Thailand was probably 20 slides where we didn't see a dentist. That the community health, you were training nurses, community health workers, anybody to cross-train in oral health. And I think that type of model is what we need. Uh, not We need dental people, but that model in Thailand at the community rule based was so impressive. So thank you for sharing that. Great, yeah, thank you. Th thank you so much. And I, I would like to add some things more. As I told you, I have started 20 years ago about oral health for older people. I never be able to start oral issues until just two or three years ago when we have the oral health policy. Before that, you have to be in the health team first to gain the acknowledge from another health team that you are part of them. You cannot jump in and then carries, carries, and carries, you see. So thank you for, you know, notice that I have to work with them until they understand and now they're ready to help us. I appreciated how you partnered with dental professionals in Costa Rica for your experiential component. I was wondering if they also came to the U.S. or if you did some, or if you have ideas or um, goals of doing like exchanges for bi-directional um, experiences. Uh, yes, always. Um, we need funding. <laughs> Um, and they were actually medical partners, which was great. Um, Dr. Farron, who was in the video, is a physician, public health physician. Um, so we try to do the interdisciplinary. But yes, we would love to do an exchange at some point. Um, I think it would be equally meaningful for our own students to, be, to build an extension course on Martha's Vineyard, for example, where we have great health disparities. Um, 
etc. So to be continued. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Laura, and I work in Nepal. And one of the things that I really uh, enjoyed about these presentations is the cross-disciplinary work. So sort of following on from the previous comment, um, just noticing the ways that, that you guys are working with dental nurses and in the school system and um, with midwives, et cetera. There, I think traditionally um, within the field of dentistry, sometimes the limitations we see have to do with scope of practice and challenges around who can do what. And there's um, obviously a lot of evidence here for some really impactful upstream interventions with fluoride varnish, silver diamine fluoride, working out in the community. And I was wondering, um, you know, maybe if two of you could say more about kind of how you've managed the role of the professional association, what that looks like in your respective countries. I think that's probably very relevant to the conversation in a US context. Mm -hmm. And for Brittany, in terms of talking about education of dental professionals, you know, how we can anticipate um, what some of those challenges might be when it really gets to looking at these things from a a policy perspective, even uh, Dr. Bruner was just talking about, you know, an example recently where sometimes those um, jockeying for position about about who can do what in the industry can be really one of the major obstacles to delivering care that we know would be helpful. So the, I think the first part of the question was how do you manage the different roles in kind of perhaps I'll go to paraphrase almost the turf wars around who does what and how all those professionals are supported in community work. Does that capture? Okay. Um, so I think one of the things that we've been pretty lucky with um, for a long time is that the Cambodia Dental Association has actually been headed for the last three um, presidencies by a paediatric, a person with paediatric dentist interest. So that has meant that we've been able to align pretty well um, and we haven't had too many barriers to using either dental nurses or dentists or dental students um, but I would say that um, I, I do think that we can see an issue whereby our dental nurses haven't yet been well advocated for within the public health system so we have a beautiful dental nurse scheme which is a three-year bachelor degree which allows that provider to do primary health care such as vaccinations and general health checks along with the basic package of oral cares and that health professional has largely been left to the weeds and what I mean by that is they open their own private practice and you know do crowns and bridges and all the other different types of dentistry that they feel like um, and so one of the areas that I think we can work on is about legitimising that role, that special role of the dental nurse as an important part of the public health system. And perhaps that's a battle we can fight over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like in Thailand, dental nurse also a very important uh, group of dental health professionals. And right now when dental nurse will be posed in the community centre, you know, the sub-district level. So they work as a team with another health professionals. So this is maybe the good part that, you know, all health will be integrated into the healthcare in the very primary care level. And I hope that um, by doing that, the health team can help us to do our health assessment in the future for our, for our care for all the people as well. So this is part of extension from my presentation for training. That's why we want to train health team about oral health. Mm -hmm. FDI's paper, Vision 2020, is anyone familiar with that paper? Uh, it's one of my favorites, and I remember being um, pleasantly surprised by what it, was, what it contained. And it really addresses your question, but from that global perspective. So it's not US specific, but there's a lot we can draw from that. And one of the things it talks about that's related to the question I asked in my presentation is what is our role as dentists today? Who are we? Uh, you know, are we in the U.S. especially facing an identity crisis as we're looking at expanding the oral health care team um, and that we're not reaching vast majorities of our population with the current education and training system we have in place? And so I think that does mean challenging ourselves to move beyond um, this perception of turf war and understanding that we need to change and shift the way we're training our professionals. And part of that related to FDI's vision is um, 
as my colleague in Vietnam um, says, you know, Dennis, there are three parts to us, our hands, our hearts, and our heads, and really expanding how we train our students to use the heart and head piece of who we are. So that ability to um, utilize the compassion that we all have that brought us into the profession, but how do we translate that into policies that serve and meet the needs of people, um, for example. And then the head part, critical thinking, problem solving, team leadership, managing a team that includes an expanded oral health care team beyond um, the clinical dentist ourselves. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to think we're headed in that direction and it's going to be um, a constructive conflict, uh, which is not a bad thing. I think the, you know, these um, challenges we're facing are ultimately going to lead to a better um, oral health care delivery system in the end because we are, you know, we are asking the hard questions um, and and really fighting to pass legislations around um, dental therapists, for example, and around who else can provide fluoride varnish, uh, for example, beyond the dentist. And I think ultimately that's just going to make these policies and requirements better. Just it's going to take longer, but I think it'll end up being better. I want to know if you know if the ADA Commission on Dental Accreditation has a standard for competency in global oral health. Uh, I know we have something about interprofessional education for dental students and also for community outreach and involvement as a requirement for dental schools. And the other question I have for Beth Bethany is? Bethany. Bethany. Yeah. Uh, is what kind of SDF did you use, a percentage? Uh, I noticed the teeth that you showed in some of the slides weren't as black as the ones I've seen in Bolivia when the decay is arrested. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions, if you might. Um, so we use the cheapest and nastiest SDF that we can get, um, <laughs> but it, it does work. It does, so um, we're using Kerry Stop and it's 30%, labeled as 30%. We've lab tested it, where it consistently comes out at about 28 or 29% um, of silver component. Um, and yeah, like I said, we get 70 to 80% arrest rate depending on whether we're using um, health professionals, depending on the age group. Um, and of course, the other variables that have been nicely listed by the Hong Kong body of work, which talks about the size of the lesion, position of the lesion, the whether or not plaque's present. How so. many applications did you do? Um, so for the images that you saw, some of them had SDF and other children had not. And so you're quite right in pointing out, for example, on that first slide with level one, that child had arrested lesions. Um, and perhaps some of the differences in light aberrations might have been because of the photography. So those images were taken in a school with a classroom fan trying to defog the mirror so we could get an image. So we didn't have dry teeth that, and, and my experience is when you take photographic images of arrested lesions that are dry, the black is quite remarkably black. What was it? Um, so uh, our original plan was to have two applications per year um, for all of the children that were participating. But what we found with further analysis was that the children that needed two applications per year were the grade one and grade two children. But those children get already the second contact in the year from level two. So they'll get their GICs and their SDF again. So for children between on grade one and grade two, they get two applications of SDF per year. For those children who are eight years and above, we find we get comparable arrest rates. I mean, 80% arrest with one application only. And that I would qualify is because we have school toothbrushing in place. And I Uh, well, the thing with Cambodian children is that most of those lesions are so open that we don't need to use your nice trick with the floss. <laughs> Good. And Sharon, you had the second part of your question, maybe directed towards Brittany about yeah. Yeah. Uh, global, global, global right, right. So, so CODA is um, the the uh, committee that on accreditation for dental schools in the U.S. And your question was, is there a global health standard for accreditation? Um, and there, there is not, as far as 
it's a requirement for dental schools. There is one that's actually been in place for a long time that um, says that global community-based experiences outside the U.S., so global health or international experiences, cannot be used to meet um, credit needs or credit requirements within the dental curriculum. For feasibility reasons, that me, you know, it's out of our scope to accredit a site that's not within the U.S., right? So, but there are now, that's right, so over 64% of dental schools now offer some sort of global health experience. How they define that varies widely right now, but many of them use it to meet credit requirements, especially within the accreditation requirement of treatment of special populations um, and some of those other community-based, right? So, um, in fact, we're seeing some schools, as they go through their accreditation process, even though this standard has been around a long time, the sheer volume of schools participating in global experiences is now calling new attention to that standard. And um, they have actually, schools that have undergone accreditation recently have been asked to put their global programs on hold or eliminate them completely. Um, so, so at AAPHD um, and, and DIA, several of us are coming together to, um, right now there's an open comment on the intent behind that standard that they are accepting, and comments are allowed until June 1st on, you know, the intent behind that standard. And so we are putting together a letter um, and seeking interested um, signature, signatures recommending um, to rethink the intent and to actually put together an advisory committee because the landscape has changed. Our students are very globally minded. Mm -hmm. Our students are very global. Our students' patient populations are extremely global. Mm -hmm. And so um, we think this standard deserves a revisit. And so, uh, you know, we've asked that they consider putting an advisory committee together and rethinking this. Yes, yes, especially a lot of our graduate and residency programs. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, we think that this is, this is a constructive um, challenge that we face, that this standard that's been around, this kind of new spotlight, I think it's temporarily um, detrimental to, to some very strong programs in, in place, but it's causing us to revisit the intent behind the standard, hopefully uh, to lead to some, some changes. Good. So but maybe that's, that's to be determined. <laughs> maybe that's something that key folks from UCS uh, yeah, Global please, Oral please Health could work yeah. with you on we're, that. We're putting that letter together okay. by June 1st, so Great. please email me if you're interested. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jean? Hi, my name is Jean Creasy. I'm a um, dentist, dental educator with a heart for global health. And um, my work in uh, Uganda has shown me the impact, I mean, just like how hard it is to try and get a, a handle on the diet, you know, as a, as, a, um, as a low socioeconomic community gets more rises in economics, the first thing they buy is sugar. The, you know, it's a sign of wealth to have a Coke can in your hand. Have you had any successful strategies using low um, literacy um, learning aids, like how do you connect with the kids or the parents in communities where literacy levels are low and health literacy is particularly low? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that? Or maybe everybody can comment. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Karen has given me some good low literacy visual aids, so I give you kudos for Thank that. You. But this it's is tough. the biggest challenge, yeah. Yeah. Maybe each of you can comment on your experience with that? Yeah, that's a really um, great question. I think, I think there's a few parts, a few things that I want to point to in deconstructing that. Um, the first part is, yeah, great, we've got some nice cartoons that we drew up and I've had great feedback for it and we can see that people are enjoying interacting with the information. Um, but the next thing I want to point out is that actually most of the Cambodian population, and we've got you know, now epidemiological surveys that show this, when I say most, I mean three out of four families already know that bad food is leading to not just caries but other NCDs. So when we prepare these nice charts and pictures and stories, we're not telling them anything that they don't know. They, they already know. Um, so then we, the next question that usually comes 
from the audience in this type of discussion is, have you ever tried motivational interviewing? Um, <laughs> and um, I think that, I mean, that's a nice question. And um, I, when I first arrived in Cambodia, um, and I was like pretty pumped up about this concept, and so I decided that I'd test it out on my dental students. So I started, I prepared this lecture about motivational interviewing, and most of them were asleep by about 15 minutes <laughs> in. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I'm not saying that it's wrong, and I think it probably works really well in the communities where it's being tested, but I don't see an application of that particular um, behaviour management thing. So the last part that I want to point to in terms of deconstructing that is that um, it's a, this diet thing is a structural issue, and um, I can see the, the specific scenario in Cambodia. We're, we're sandwiched between Vietnam and Thailand, and we've got that port of Senecville, which is now a Chinese city. Um, and we have this type of food coming across the border. If you do a Google search on um, business in Cambodia, you can find web pages which are saying Cambodia is wide open for import. Um, so I would say that even in a scenario where we've created a healthy school, uh, we're still going to have that tension of a mother trying to feed her children with the food that's available in her environment. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or his environment, because this is not just a woman's problem. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Pat. It's not so easy for me to, to answer this. Maybe uh, for my own opinion, uh, individual uh, teaching follow literacy people, it might be difficult and take a lot of efforts for the success. For some part of the success that I've seen in my country, maybe for healthy eating policy that some of the nursery set up in the rural, very rural area, because now when the mother is very busy, they tend to send the kids to the, the nursery at one point one year and a half, really low age. So if they want to send the kids to this nursery, some nursery set up the rule, like the policy that you cannot put sugar in the bags or something like that. This is just educate them that this thing is important. So now in, in, instead of directly teaching, it won't, might, might not work, yeah. So it's through the policy. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm just going to add to that. We're working with um, the government and consumer advocacy groups in Mexico City right now. Mexico City is kind of a world leader right now on sugar, sweetened beverage policies. And so the world's watching what they're doing. And um, the placement of these products and the pricing of these products is deliberate. It's a campaign by very well-resourced global organizations. So asking people to change their behaviors, is, is, it's a David and Goliath situation. Well, on that final challenge, I think, yeah, that's, that's a big one. And I'm glad that we're emphasizing that because it's really hard for individual families one at a time to make these healthy choices when the environment is unhealthy. And so I, I would say we need to not only get our dental students uh, out of the clinic into the community, but also up into the legislatures and into the boardrooms because we have a lot of advocacy to make our environment healthier for families and, and older adults as well. Yeah. So thank you. I think that's the end of our question and answer session. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sokol Gutierrez. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we've had some excellent presentations today on some very exciting initiatives in education and public health in action. So I'd like to thank our speakers, um, everybody that um, came as part of the audience, and especially special thanks to, I have a list of people here. So our Global Health Oral Health Steering Committee, uh, the names of the individuals are in your program, and then the incredible and tireless work of Roger Mraz, <laughs> Megan Rilla, back there. I don't know where Roger is. He's probably setting up at the next 
next part. And also, oh, there he is. The bright light is blinding me. And Dorian Hollis and all the volunteers, wonderful volunteers that helped um, with the tech stuff in the, in the camera, and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. Um, so thank you all for being here today, and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you.